The Rotarian in the Northfield Club, he is a Paul Harris Fellow. He is part of Rotary International's Environmental, Environmental Sustainability Action Group. And in 2017, he and his friends started the Rotary Climate Action Team in his club. He's a native Minnesotan, though he graduated from Oregon State uh, University with a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Science and Management in 1972. He served in the St. Cloud Army National Guard for six years uh, before starting his professional scouting career. And in 1978 to 2012, after 34 years of executive service uh, with the Boy Scouts. In October of 2012, when he retired, he and his wife, Deb, attended the Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College, my alma mater, on the health of our oceans with some of the top scientists in the field uh, making presentations. It inspired him to take an online course from MIT on the science of climate change, and he began giving public education talks on the subject. He and his wife, Debbie, have been married 50 years and have two grown children, five little grandchildren, and want to focus his concern on the health of the planet that we will leave to them. So with that, help me welcome Alan Anderson. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to come and speak to Rotary Clubs. I've, I've had the privilege of talking to quite a number of clubs around uh, southern and, and central Minnesota. And I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit about the science of climate change, but also the impacts, but especially what we can all be doing about it. So we'll jump in and I encourage you to uh, jot any questions that you might have down because we will have time for Q&A towards the end. As you know, uh, Rotary International has had for quite some time six major focus areas and they're listed there and they're all critically important. But now we have a seventh area of focus, a new one, and you might ask why? And that's because the other six are all threatened by climate change and our degradation of the environment. So by unanimous vote of the RI board and the trustees, we have protecting the environment. And a big chunk of that is about climate change. So just jumping back a little bit to, to high school science, um, what is the problem with CO2 and the greenhouse gases and so forth? And on the left side of the screen, you see kind of the natural setup. And greenhouse gases are good because if we didn't have them, the earth would be a frozen rock. So greenhouse gases are good. They make it a livable world. But like so many other things in life, too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. Uh, since the 1700s, we have been digging up ancient fossil fuels and burning them and pumping all that CO2 into the atmosphere, which makes the greenhouse gas blanket thicker and thicker. And just like putting more blankets on your bed, the more blankets we have, the more heat is trapped on the surface. And so the more CO2 we pump up there, the warmer the planet's going to get. And CO2 levels, uh, we started measuring them very seriously back in 1958 on a mountaintop in Hawaii. And this is the, the measured record of the steady upward march of atmospheric CO2. And interestingly, the little jagged line every year is that most of the green plants on the planet are in the northern hemisphere. And when the north is in summer, all those plants are sucking in CO2. And then in the winter, there's a lot less of them and we go the other direction. And that's the little annual jog you see there in the line. But unfortunately, the march is steadily upward. And even though during these years, there have been all kinds of different events and even volcanoes, they have barely made a blip on the chart compared to all the fossil fuels that were burning and pumping into the atmosphere. And we're currently at about actually 420 parts per million. And that doesn't sound like much, but it's a 50% increase in the pre-industrial amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, 50% increase. 
And we haven't been at that level for about three million years. And the last time we were there, some three million years ago, sea levels were about 60 feet higher and the temperatures were considerably warmer. And that's kind of the direction that we're moving in uh, unless we decide to change something. And some folks have said, well, you know, the, the climate has always changed. And that's generally true. There are big oscillations in the climate. And this is actually from the ice core records in Antarctica. And you can see, especially in the last 400,000 years, there's a big 100,000 year cycle. And the peaks of those cycles are called interglacial warm periods. And the, the lowest parts are when North America is covered in glaciers. So there are big cycles. And this is actually the CO2 level record from the ice core. And you might ask, how, how can they do that? Well, they can do it because they can actually get the trapped air bubbles out of the ice and find out their composition. And they've got a lot of other ways too. But you can see for 800,000 years, we did not get above 300 parts per million. That's the natural cycle. And now you see 1911, 1958, uh, and today, we are way, way outside the natural cycle. And that's purely from burning fossil fuels. So some time ago in the 80s, NASA scientists were wondering what's going to happen if we keep putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere. And um, a scientist named Dr. James Hansen and a whole team of scientists from NASA made three projections. And each projection was a different level of CO2 emissions. And they made that uh, projection at the time of the dotted line on the screen back in the early 80s. And they projected the three, the bright red, the orange, and the kind of gray line were projections of where they thought we would go with different amounts of emissions. And a lot of skeptics said, that's not going to happen. We're going to even maybe even have cooling, but we'll probably be flat. And actually, you really can't know any of that stuff anyway. Well, now we look at 30 years later, actually almost 40 years later, where the temperatures have actually gone and who was right. The NASA scientists were right. And actually, the red star at the far right hand is where we finished 2023. And actually, they were even surprised at what a big jump it was in global average temperatures. So a key thing that, that we need to really understand in our head and in our gut is the more CO2 we pump up there, the hotter it's going to get. And the physics are just that simple. So um, back in 2018 and every uh, several years, the uh, US puts out a national climate assessment. And this, was, this is information from the one in 2018. 300 scientists, 13 federal agencies, including defense and commerce and energy. And the cliff notes of their very detailed study is, climate change is definitely happening now. It's primarily caused by CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels. The impacts are basically irreversible. And so it's serious and we must act now if we want to protect current and future generations. And of course, as we warm up the planet, the ice is melting everywhere. The only place it's not melting is in the very heart of the Antarctic. But even the ice shelf around the Antarctic has been getting less and less. And this last summer, which is last season for them down there, they had a new record low amount of um, sea ice around the Antarctic. And the west uh, peninsula of the Antarctic is the glaciers there are melting. And that's raising sea levels. And it's already starting to impact property values. And 
uh, for folks in places like Miami Beach or Norfolk, Virginia, where there's a lot of low-lying neighborhoods, they have what's called blue sky flooding when the sun and the moon line up for a king tide and seawater boils up the storm sewers and floods the streets with salt water. And that is not going to get better. That is only going to get worse. And you'd have to say, who's going to be buying those houses on those streets? It's going to be a, a real problem. So the climate, pack, climate change and the impacts are not something in the distant future. It's already happening. Um, and uh, torrential rains, this is a couple years ago now. Houston had four and a half feet of rain in one rain episode. The biggest uh, rain event in the continental US in one, in one event. A blue sky flooding, as I mentioned, uh, although, the, although the number of hurricanes may not increase, the power of hurricanes is increasing because they get their power from the warmth of the water underneath them. And as you might have read last summer, the ocean set new record high temperatures for the ocean water. And off the shore on the Gulf side, uh, down there, some days the water was almost like hot tub water <laughs> uh, in the shallows. Increasing droughts in some places, torrential rains in others. Uh, last year, Phoenix set a new record down there, 31 days in a row where it was never uh, the high was always 110 or more, and the nights never got below 90. And if you don't have shelter, that will kill you. Um, and unfortunately, they had a fair number of homeless people and seniors without proper care who lost their lives to the heat. And it's only going to get hotter until we do something to stop it. So 22 and 23 especially were filled with all kinds of climate disasters. Um, and I'll, I'll let you skim that, but um, they continue to get worse. And this is um, both events and the cost of those events by decade for the last four decades. And it's inflation adjusted dollars so you can just look at that and say, obviously we don't want to stay on that trend line, but we will stay on the trend line as long as we keep pumping more CO2 into the atmosphere. And one of the things that's kind of sobering about this chart is that it doesn't even count sea level rise because that's not an event. It's a slow, very slow coming thing, but it makes some of the events worse if there's a hurricane and ocean levels are higher than the storm surge is worse. And scientists say that sea level alone will probably be the most expensive part of the hurricane or of the climate challenge because ocean levels have been so stable for centuries that we built big cities right on the coast all over the world. And in many of those cities, there's going to be no defending them uh, against a rising ocean. So scientists are telling us that um, as long as we keep pumping up more CO2, the impacts will get increasingly negative and there will be no place to hide. It'll be challenging for people everywhere. <laughs> If you skim down those events, almost every one of them is getting worse because of climate change. And it's sobering to think about, but we faced a lot of challenges in the past as a country. And we need to face this challenge also because these things can all get worse or we can get them stopped so that they don't keep getting even worse. So the, the trend line is very sobering. You might have heard that um, 
when the International Climate Conference gets together, the IPCC, um, that's actually climate scientists from all over the world. And they get together to review all of the latest science and put out a report. And <clears throat> one of the things they've said is, based on what we already know, we really would like to keep the increase in global temperatures under 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. And we definitely have to keep it under 2%. That would be catastrophic. But then you look at the trend line, and we actually finished 2023 above 1.5, although one year does not the trend make. But we'll, if we stay on the current path, we'll be passing 1.5, probably in the next eight years. And if we stay on the same path, we're gonna pass a two degree increase, probably around 2050, which is only 26 years away. And this chart makes me think a lot about my kids and my grandkids, because my grandkids aren't gonna be very old when, in uh, 26 years from now. Uh, and this is going to be their world. And our challenge is to understand this in our hearts and in our heads and say, we need to do what we can do about it. So the big challenge is reducing carbon emissions along with other greenhouse gases. And currently the world is kind of on the broad blue path there, which brings us over 2.5 and maybe close to three. Uh, the pledges, if they were actually all kept, would get us to the blue pledges and targets line, still too high. If we could get to net zero, uh, somewhere around the middle of the century, that would be orange line. And you can see where we really need to be is on the green line. And so, Business as usual is not going to work for any of our kids or grandkids. And if we care about them, we need to do something. So the rotary connection. Climate change is happening and that is the truth. And CO2 emissions are the main cause. Not the only one, but the main one. And it's really unfair to absolutely everybody on the planet but if Rotary and Rotarians can do our part to help fix it, that will build goodwill and that'll be beneficial to all current and future generations. And we Rotarians aren't afraid of hard projects. When you look at what we've done with polio, it is truly outstanding. I think when we began the campaign, there was over 100 countries with endemic polio. And today we're down to two and we're chasing them down. One of the sobering things though, is that if we start flooding cities and creating more climate migrants that have to go into big refugee camps, polio is gonna rise again also. We just don't wanna go there. We need to roll up our sleeves and do what we can do. So if you go to the Rotary uh, website and you look under our causes, you'll find the seven focus areas and if you go to protecting our environment, you see right in the middle there, one of the keys is climate change and climate action. And in the description of uh, the focus area, items four and five in the statement of purpose, uh, addressing the causes of climate change and climate disruption and supporting solutions that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the macro summary, it's rising CO2 and it's us. We're the ones who are burning all those fossil fuels. And it's urgent because, because of the size and the heat sink of the oceans and the fact that when we pump CO2 into the atmosphere, about a third of it stays there for centuries. So it keeps accumulating there. So between the CO2 in the atmosphere and the, and the heat sink, the warmth of the oceans, whenever we can finally level off uh, the temperature, that'll probably be the new normal for the next thousand years before all the natural systems can really deal with all this stuff. 
And that's why it's urgent, because we don't want it to get any warmer than we can possibly prevent it from being. So our world and our children's world is quite literally at risk. And the good news is that there are real solutions and we Rotarians are challenged now by Rotary to do something about it. And that's all pretty sobering stuff. Is there some good news? There's a lot of good news. All the countries in the world now agree with the science and pledge to reduce their CO2 emissions. The unfortunate part of that is that not many countries are doing a very good job yet and CO, global CO2 is still rising. New solar and wind are growing at about 10 times the pace of new fossil fuels, uh, energy production plants, and solar is now the cheapest new energy source anywhere. In fact, it's so cheap that XL Energy, uh, and I, probably provides a bunch of the cities and it includes Northfield. XL Energy goes as far as Colorado. And they've actually now shut down an, a working coal plant to build a brand new solar plant with batteries because it's cheaper. So you'd have to say, if it's cheaper, why would we do anything else? Let's go there. Um, China and India are the two biggest uh, Two of the biggest emitters, we're actually number two. Uh, and China deployed more wind and solar last year than the rest of the world combined. They're a big problem, they're burning lots of coal, but they get it and they're working faster than anyone right now to build up their renewable sources. And it's important to remember that the US, us, we're still the biggest per capita emitter of CO2. And we like to say, well, you know, we're the, we're the innovation giants uh, of the world. And I'd say, let's prove that. Let's innovate. Let's make solar panels that are cheaper and that are 10 times more efficient. Let's figure out batteries that can take a car a thousand miles. Let's get all these things figured out. And it's not impossible. I always hearken back to when we changed from horses to Model Ts, and at the time, there were no gas stations and there were no service stations. And you had to buy your gas at the hardware store by the can and go put it in your car. And if you needed service, you had a problem because there weren't any service stations. Uh, and there actually wasn't enough rubber. And, Henry Ford went to South America and started a whole new rubber plantation to keep up with the new rubber demand. There are big challenges. Nothing will be perfect. There will be setbacks. There will be mistakes. But one thing we know for sure, we have to quit burning fossil fuels if we love our kids and grandkids. Um, and jobs. More people are now employed just in solar than in the entire coal industry. So as far as economics and jobs, this can be not a bad thing, but it can be a boon to the, to the whole country and employment. So some, some more good news, renewables changing prices. As recently as 2010, uh, power from photovoltaic was $378 a megawatt. And you can see that's dropped down to $68 now, just nine years later. So it's even lower now, by the way. And uh, so went onshore, offshore, and solar all cheaper now. Why would we want to pay more? And one of our really big challenges is getting, uh, you've probably heard about the uh, infrastructure, the Jobs and Infrastructure Act that a bipartisan Congress passed a couple years ago. And part of that was building out and, and strengthening our whole uh, electric grid infrastructure. And we desperately need to because all of the dots on this map are either already built or they're being built, but they're not yet hooked up. So that's solar, wind, uh, batteries, and uh, there's as much stuff built and ready to hook up as we already have online. 
if we could hook all this stuff up, we'd double uh, our capacity. So if you get a chance to talk to your state and federal legislators about uh, improving the Big Wires Act and reducing the, all of the hurdles that it takes to get hooked up, please do that. We need to get all this stuff hooked up. So, um, Rotary. We're known across the world for the amazing things that we have done, uh, and not the least of which is polio. Um, so we know how to get things done, and we don't ignore big problems. We've got global reach, credibility, social capital. We know how to have a real impact, and we believe in helping other people. We believe in helping disadvantaged people, and we believe in protecting the planet. That's working on climate change works on all those things. And, and I would suggest that there's nothing that Rotary can do that will help more people for more generations than to working on the climate crisis. And young people today all care about the climate crisis. And if we want to attract them to our clubs as members, we need to show them that we're working on the stuff they care about. And uh, a little side story here, down in um, our club down in Northfield, uh, we have something called a Rotary Climate Action Team that I'm part of. And we have now had three new members who said they joined the club because we're working on climate. So what can Rotarians do? Because it's a huge problem. But we're all part of the problem, so we can all work on our part of the problem. And on the table, there should be a handout for everybody with some of these things listed on it. I would encourage you to start a climate action team in your club, and, and our club can be a resource for you. Uh, take the Global Climate Pledge, which some 350 other rot Rotary clubs have already done, pledging that we're gonna start working on this big challenge. Uh, consider joining the nonpartisan Citizens Climate Lobby that has reds and blues and independents all working together on bipartisan federal legislation to address the climate crisis. Uh, and then Rotary itself has the Environmental Sustainability Action Group, and that's a very active team also working on climate. And then as individuals, there's a lot of things that we all can do. And uh, 2022, the federal government passed the strangely named Inflation Reduction Act, which is the biggest climate bill in US history. And I, I was perplexed by the title too, and it was probably named that to increase its chances of getting passed. <laughs> but in fact, working on climate and stopping the rising temperature is a inflation reduction. All over the country, everybody's homeowner's insurance rate is going up and up and up. In Florida and in California, it's skyrocketing and in some places you can't even get it. And that's all because of the unbelievable damage that the more powerful storms have been doing around the country. Inflation, inflationary to insurance rates. And then it's beginning in many parts of the country and in fact, right now in Africa, a lot of the countries are having significant crop damage from heat, just heat. Uh, and as their crops fail, the price of food is gonna go up and that will be inflationary. So there's a tie in there even to the title. So one of the things we can all also do is talk about it because when you don't talk about something and the people around you don't talk about it, then we're not thinking about it. And if we're not thinking about it, we're not gonna do anything about it. So um, one, of, one of the rock stars among the climate scientists, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe of Texas Tech, who's an evangelical Christian and does a lot of speaking about climate change. She said, one of the most important things everybody can do for free is talk to your friends and your family and your neighbors and your club about climate change and what can we all do. And these are 
three of the reasons I'm here today. These are three of my five little grandkids, Lucy, Ev, and June. And I imagine them asking me, are you and the other grown-ups taking care of our little blue planet? And I'd have to say, no, we're not doing a very good job at all. And I'm going to work on it. And I would invite you to imagine your kids and grandkids asking you the same. And, and I'd invite you to join the effort. Because either we're working on it or we're not. Uh, and children everywhere need us to act because quite literally, their future is in our hands. We can't wait for them to take care of it later because later is going to be too late. So climate change is really the biggest issue of our generation, although you'd never know it from reading the paper or watching the news because they like to provide what people want to hear and a lot of people don't want to hear about this, so they're going to not tell us. Uh, how many of you happen to see the, the, the movie Don't Look Up? Anybody see that? And it was actually about climate change is what the point was. If we're not paying attention, if we don't want to talk about it, if we don't look up, we just hope nothing happens until the end comes. And the problem is that it'll be the end for our kids and our grandkids. And we can't let that happen. So I'd encourage you to get involved personally. And there's lots of different ways as on the handout there that we can, um, because nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. We can all do our part. And when we talk to people, we can get them to do their part and multiply the whole effort till we're really making a difference. Questions? Yes, sir. What's your opinion um, on improving on, on nuclear power to help us with this problem? I don't see a lot in the media, but then when I do read something, it sounds like a really good idea. So. Um, after Three Mile Island and then Chernobyl and then, was it Fukushima? Um, a lot of people became terrified of nuclear and places like Germany actually even started shutting nuclear plants down. But if you take all of the different ways that we generate energy from uh, coal and oil and natural gas and even solar and wind, the one that has had the fewest fatalities because of that energy source is nuclear. In fact, coal has killed probably millions of people over the years from black lung disease and mine accidents and all the rest. Um, in France, they get 80% of all the electricity from nuclear, never had an accident. Uh, we have to have it. We have to keep what we've got turning and then we have to figure out how to make more, better, smaller, safer. And there are a lot of organizations working on that. And we actually have smaller, safer, better in all of our nuclear ships. All of our aircraft carriers and our big cruisers, they're all nuclear powered. So we kind of already know how to do it. We need to figure out how to make it safer and, and more commercially available and so forth. Got to have it. Um, the electric car. <clears throat> Janet Yellen, she's a mighty force, she has asked the Chinese leader to not send their cheap, yucky cars over here so we can do it. But they're not being purchased over here very, very much. Yeah, so, so, so actually the, the uh, electric cars here, and I did think when all of the automakers announced that we're going to have 30 new all-electric models by, you know, in five years, I thought, that might be a little fast. <laughs> but in fact, um, sales are still rising nicely. They're just not rising as fast as everybody expected them to. But they're still going up. And um, I think in the, on my handout there, there's a place to Google Rewiring America uh, where you can learn a lot more about it. But you can also find out a lot about the IRA Act, which offers right now to all of us a $7,500 uh, rebate from the feds for buying an electric car, a $2,500 rebate from the state of Minnesota. 
So $10,000 off a new electric car right now. And there's big bucks being spent both in the Infrastructure Act, excuse me, and the um, IRA bill for building out the um, recharging stations. And that's actually been what slowed a lot of people down because they say, well, you know, it, I would love an electric car for just around town and you can just plug it into a 110 in your garage every night and you'll be all electric all the time in town, no problem. But when you wanna to drive to California, then you have to all of a sudden do all this careful mapping with your apps. Of course, there's apps for all the charging stations all the way. Uh, and if you happen to have a Tesla, you can just tell them where you're going and it'll figure out the distance that would be comfortable to go each day and exactly where you can charge and so forth. Tesla has built more charging stations than the rest combined, but the rest are working hard to catch up. And Tesla has now made their charging stations available to all the other manufacturers. So that'll be a big deal too. So I encourage you, uh, because again, if, you, if we always keep in mind, we have to quit burning net fossil fuels. We have to. And we're going to, the question is, are we gonna do it soon enough before it gets too hot? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I know it's Excel Energy is trying to go to completely all uh, renewable energy. But one of the questions I get when we say to go to electric, people say, where is electric, electricity form? And they say, coal plants. Yeah. So now Excel is doing it, but how about the rest of the country doing it, because still, you got all these coal plants that are creating electricity. So that's why they're saying, well, you know, it's got to be created somewhere. Yeah. And who's the important and how is that being done? Yep, that's a good question. So we're actually slowly and steadily shutting down coal plants in this country. And we've shut down, I think in the last five years, we shut down like 130 coal plants. And we're replacing them. Unfortunately, we're replacing a lot of them with natural gas plants, which is almost as bad, actually, when you consider all the leaked methane along the way. So we've got to build out wind, solar, batteries, hydro, nuclear, uh, and we need to do all that as fast as we can to replace those coal plants. But until we do, we're gonna need them running until we can replace them. Um, however, in, in a test by MIT, if you take an electric car that's charged by a coal plant and a gas car, the electric car is still more efficient and requires less fossil fuel energy because electric is so much more efficient than an internal combustion engine. So even if we're still only on coal for electricity, you're still ahead of the game environmentally by buying an electric car. And then of course in Minnesota, Excel has promised us that by 2030, 80% of all of our electricity will be from renewable and by 2040, 100%. And, and actually the other big uh, supplier in Minnesota, Great River Energy has made the same promise. So more and more uh, companies are going to see the handwriting on the wall and that and they've got grandkids too i mean if they understand the science they should be all in on trying to make this transition if you google research on improving uh, ev range you, you get all kinds of fascinating stuff about universities and corporations and car companies working on that exact problem how can we number one get the rare earth metals out of the batteries, cobalt from the Congo and so forth, and replace them with much more abundant materials that we can mine responsibly. And then number two, how can we increase the range? And all of that is happening. Um, I just read that there's a small battery company that believes that they're gonna be able to make a thousand mile battery for an average size sedan probably within the next five years. So when you think again back to the horse and buggy days moving to cars, 
there's an awful lot of answers we didn't have. We, did, all, we also didn't have any paved roads except cobblestone in cities. We solved all those problems as we went along. And that's what we need to do here. And the thing to keep in the back of your mind is we have to quit burning fossil fuels. That's the thing that is not optional. So how can, how can we do that? How can we get there? Another quick one. Uh, I just read about a university in Germany that believes that they are going to be able to improve the, the efficiency of solar panels by a factor of 10. Again, commercially available maybe in the next couple of years. And so there's so much research going on that technology has got to be part of what's going to save us, but we need to be creating the political will by pressuring uh, our state and federal um, representatives, whatever their party, to work on climate solutions. And I only have one more last thing. If you would like the Our National Academy of Science report on climate change, evidence, and causes, it's uh, only like 25 pages, lots of charts and graphs, layperson's terms. I can send you the electronic copy if you give me your email on the sign-up sheet on the back of the room. And thank you so much. I'll be happy to hang around. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, and we're glad that you could stick around. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>